Amen. All right, well, we're continuing our series in James and real faith, and we're looking up uh, partway through chapter three. You know, I heard a guy speak, I haven't read this book, but I heard a guy speak um, recently about his book, the dorky looking guy in the middle, I think. It's called The Good Life. It's from lessons from the world's longest study on happiness. And it's like a decades long study from Harvard University. There's a whole department of Harvard dedicated to what makes a good life and social research and psychology and all that sort of stuff. And these are the authors of this book, studied thousands of lives over decades and insights and questions and people's different experiences and all the lessons they learned about what makes a good life. And we're going to be talking about the good life this morning. And I'm going to give you our main point right up front. And it's this, that godly wisdom brings life to our lives. It's a secret to living a good life, to living life well, and that real faith, James talking about real faith, lives wisely. Real faith lives wisely. Our passage today is James 3 and starting at verse 13. And James starts with a question. He said, who is wise and understanding among you? Who is wise and understanding among you? Why is he asking that question in the middle of his letter? Well, it's because there's been some problems in the church. If you've been here, you'll know this, that there's been some division and some favoritism and some neglect of some people and some bad teaching and poor leadership and some disputes. So he's saying, don't just follow anyone. Don't listen to any voice, but make sure you follow wise and understanding people and make sure you are a wise and understanding person yourself and are becoming one. So how do you know who that is? He answers their own question. He says, let them show it by their good life their good deeds done in humility. That's what constitutes a wise person, their good life. It's actually probably more accurate to say that word really means their good way of life or their good mode of life or how they go about life. That's what that word really means there. So it's by their habits, their practices, their behaviours, their good way of life, by their authentic, humble and consistently lived out faith. That's how you recognise a wise and understanding person by that. In scripture, wisdom is essentially the ability to live life well, to not mess it up, to do well in life. And it's highly valued, as Petra just read to us, Proverbs said it's more precious than gold and fine rubies, more valuable than that. The ability to make good decisions and pursue right priorities and build healthy and strong relationships And be a person of character and integrity. That's valuable. And that is what wisdom is. That helps us live life well. And in scripture, uh, you get the impression, if you read between the lines, and it's kind of, um, we know this anyway, you don't really fluke a good life. It's not something you can really fluke. You have to pay attention to it. And there's some skill and some learning required to do that. And James understands that. And he says there's two types of wisdom you can pursue and follow. Two paths we can go down in life. And they have extremely different origins and extremely different outcomes, these two paths. The first one, he says, and he talks about, or read about, is worldly wisdom. Verse 14, he says, But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, in quotes, doesn't come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Worldly wisdom is earthly, unspiritual and demonic. Sounds terrible. What he means is it speaks from a perspective that shuts God out, as if God doesn't exist. As if this life is all there is. That's that's where it comes from. It's unspiritual in that the life-giving spirit of God is absent from this wisdom. It originates from the forces of darkness and it leads to disorder and every kind of evil practice. And at its core, it's selfish and self-seeking. It encourages us to do what we want, take what we want, pursue what we want, be who we want, to think of ourselves first, put ourselves at the centre of our life and universe. It's about me and mine and more. That's the message that comes through. And despite how it may be presented and packaged and sold to us, in all sorts of ways. The wisdom of the world doesn't lead to a good life. It's actually the wrong path. It's a, but it leads actually to an unsatisfying and empty one, even if not at first, but eventually. 
That's where it ends up. It might appear like wisdom, but James puts it in quotes because it's really not wisdom at all. And it causes problems. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Because they were fighting and quarrelling a bit in this church. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Not literally, probably, mostly, but you wound and, and hurt people with your fighting and quarrelling and your words. You desire, but you do not have. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures, on yourself. You see, notice while he's talking about worldly wisdom, he's actually talking to the people in the church, not the people outside there, who obviously are going to live with a sense of worldly wisdom because they don't have God's wisdom available in the same way. You see, it's actually possible for the wisdom of the world to actually influence us as people in the church, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, the wisdom of our culture to influence how we live and how we practice our faith and how we view our faith, which is what was happening here it can seep in, it can fool us, and it can subtly suck us in. And there's actually three signs in that, those last few verses I read that that may just have happened to us. Three signs to watch out for that we've been influenced by worldly wisdom. First one, it produces fights and division, quarrels. It eventually leads to fights and quarrels and greed and jealousy and discontent and broken relationships and power struggles and all those things, unhappiness. Wherever it is followed, whether that's in our families or our businesses or in the community or in the church, it doesn't really matter if it's in the church. If those, that fruit is what's evident, then worldly wisdom is being followed somewhere because that is the sort of outcome of worldly wisdom. Secondly, not only does it produce fights and division, we forget God when we follow worldly wisdom. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. We don't pray. We don't trust God. We don't believe that we need God for what we want. Don't they think we don't need him. We say, focus on ourselves, what others have, what we want, how we can get it, that we forget God and use our own skills and our own words and our own power plays and our own take shortcuts to get our own way and pursue what we want without him. There's a book I haven't read, but I saw the title and I heard the guy talk and I think I know what it's about. So It's called The Christian Atheist, which sounds like an oxymoron, like Christian Atheist, how can you be a Christian and Atheist? But essentially he's saying there's a whole bunch of people, and there probably always has been throughout the church history, who on one hand are Christian, they have the beliefs, and they have the beliefs, they give a nod to the beliefs, they live like God doesn't matter. Like he doesn't exist. The Christian atheist might do the things that you do, might do the Sunday things, but essentially for the rest of their life, it's like he doesn't exist. We forget God, James says, when we follow worldly wisdom. And the third thing he says in that passage, a sign that you, we may be being influenced by worldly wisdom, is not just that there's fights and division, or that we forget God and and go about things, pursuing them in our own strength, as Richard talked about in our intro. But we pray selfish prayers. He says, you ask with wrong motives that you may get what you want for your own pleasure. We pray self-centred prayers for my blessing and my comfort and my easier life. And there's no concern in our prayers for the poor and those suffering and for reaching out to the lost and vulnerable and that sort of thing. We treat God like our personal heavenly Santa Claus or genie in a bottle, he says. So these things, these three things are signs that we may have been influenced by worldly wisdom. And let's face it, worldly wisdom is all around us and comes at us in our culture from all sorts of directions, doesn't it? Yeah, obviously we can pick out things like social media and billboards and advertising and TV shows and books and stuff which are not bad necessarily and influencers who give us all sorts of advice and scroll through our screens and even our friends and our culture and the places we work it's not that everything they say or everything that's on those things is bad there's a lot of good stuff just because it's not Christian it can still have an element of truth but we recognise destructive worldly wisdom 
because it calls us to do whatever makes us happy, to put ourselves above other people, to do what we feel like, to have this, experience that, go there, and you'll be happy. It's self-centered. Think of yourself first. God is irrelevant type of message. So we need to recognize that wherever it comes at us in those messages. But it's not actually just those places. I was listening to a podcast yesterday with, um, well, I was walking. I will say running, but it was so slow. I'll call it a walk. And um, it was John Anderson, the former Deputy Prime Minister. Older people will remember him. He's a Christian guy and a, he was, a, you know, I think, a really good politician. Um, and he's interviewing someone in the UK and he does these series of interviews and the person was talking about how our culture has changed, even in, since John Anderson was in government you know, 15 years ago. The culture has changed dramatically in Western countries. And the guy was making the point, the other guys, it's not just social media and books and TV. That is important. But there's this group of what you might call elites, people who are in positions of influence in universities and government departments and things. They're not all bad people, but there are, you know, there are when they do surveys of these people's beliefs, there's a majority of people who hold very influential positions all around these Western countries who have a very worldly wisdom who want to put their agenda onto the masses. And I think it's true to some degree. And what they're saying is these people have disproportionate influence over culture, over us, the way things have gone and are going. And it's very hard for us to opt out of that or not be influenced by that for some way. So I'm just making the point that worldly wisdom comes at us from all directions as well. So we need to be aware of it. But godly wisdom, thankfully, is totally different. It's totally different. Verse 17 of chapter 3. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Godly wisdom is fundamentally pure and peace-loving. It's a completely different origin and a completely different outcome from worldly wisdom. It's considerate of other people's interests before its own. It's submissive, not demanding. It's full of mercy, James says, not unforgiveness. It produces good fruit in us, not bitter envy. It's sincere, not false or hypocritical, it doesn't have a hidden agenda. And it produces a harvest of righteousness in our lives, the healthier relationships, deeper levels of satisfaction, a greater sense of love and joy and peace in our lives when we follow its path. You know, this idea of two ways to live, two paths, two wisdoms, is actually right throughout Scripture. James isn't just making this up. Way back in Joshua, uh, if you know the story, Joshua's lead, led the people after Moses. They've come into the Promised Land in his... Um, getting towards the end of his life, he makes this famous speech in Joshua 24 to gathers all the people and he puts before them a choice. He says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors of the, from Egypt, the false gods, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, if you really can't walk away from these false gods, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors and of Egypt in the land you are living, the world around you, the culture. If you want to live that way, do that. But as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. It's two-choice idea, two-paths idea, one that leads to life and one that doesn't. Psalm 1, famous psalm, not someone, Psalm 1. <laughs> Blessed are those who walk in the um, you know, ways of the Lord, delight in his word. They'll be like trees planted in the thing. But those who walk in the way of the wicked and sit and stand um, in the way of the wicked will be like chaff blown away. A complete contrast. Two ways. And then Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, always says it um, succinctly. He says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many go that way. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it choice. And James tells his readers too that they need to make a choice. Chapter 4 verse 4. He says, "You adult he's getting a bit strong language here. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity or opposition or being against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy 
of God. This is strong language. What he's really trying to say is you need to make a choice. You can't sit on the fence about which path you take in life. You can't go down two different paths at once. It's kind of physically impossible. You can't be a friend of the world and be opposed to God. What does he mean? Are we meant to be unfriendly to people outside these walls? Not be their friends? Well, he's not talking about the world in that sense, the people. He's talking about the sinful and selfish immoral values and system and ways of the world, the wisdom of the world that comes at us. We're not to be cosy best buddies with that, with the world in that sense. We need to be careful. And we're not to be influenced by its so-called wisdom and ways. And we do need to actually be careful about being too close to people who actually lead us down that path as well. Because, as everybody knows, the scripture says and everybody knows, the company we keep will largely determine the path we take. It will. It does. You don't have to be Christian to believe that. Plenty of studies have shown that. that it's the biggest influence on your life is the company you keep. So we need to choose wisely there. And then he says this. Or do you think scripture says without reason that God jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us and lead us? This is strange language. God is jealous. Thought God was good. Thought there was no sin in God. God jealous? Why is God jealous? Well, I'm a jealous. I'm jealous, for example, for my kids, for their future, for good choices in their life. I'm watching out. I want the best. I'm a bit protective, a bit sensitive about that and what happens. Sorry, and they, they will say I'm a bit sensitive and protective. But I hate it, the thought of them making dumb choices. So I'm a bit jealous for that. Because I love them, because I care about them. I want the best for their future. And God jealously wants what's best for us. He hates it when we make dumb decisions. Or choices, or get led astray, or go down the wrong path. So he's jealous. So how do we get this godly wisdom? What's the secret to having it in our life? Head into a new year. How do we live with this godly wisdom that James is talking about? Well, he tells us in verse 7, he says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. We submit ourselves to God. We resist the ways of the evil one and and his so-called wisdom. We come near to God in genuineness and repentance and we humble ourselves before him, allow him to lead and guide and lift us up. You know, the Christian life is kind of like a two-pronged thing. We kind of are called to go in two directions at once. Do you know, it said, come near to God, but resist the devil. So we're going towards God, but we're going away from the devil. That's the only way it really works. We move towards God and move away from the devil and the ways of the um, world and their wisdom. At the same time, it takes some skill to navigate that. This is the Christian life, the Lord's Prayer, you know. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Eyes on the Lord. And it says, um, and lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. Both, we need both aspects to our Christian life. You know, I think the danger is that some people want the ways of God with the ways of the world as well. As if you just take both and go have them side by side, but it doesn't work like that. They're mutually exclusive. And frankly... Off the record, I think that sometimes, I'm not, no, I shouldn't say this, but I just, it's too late now. Sometimes some churches, as, I'm not, no one particularly, honestly, I've got no one in mind particularly. But some churches are really trying to encourage people to follow the ways of Jesus, but they're doing it using the ways of the world. And they're going both in the same direction rather than trying to subvert that culture and build this one. And it's, it's a two prong attack. And then he says, change your laughter to morning, joy to gloom. Oh, that's good news, isn't it? Bit of misery guts for Sunday morning. Start crying. Stop laughing. Don't enjoy yourself in church. What's he talking about? He's just really saying, don't be flippant. This is serious. Don't just laugh it off. This matters for the direction of your life. The truth, the insight, the wisdom are available to those who truly want it, who are desperate for it. And understand that they need God and ask for it. You know, Jesus said something funny sometimes, and I know 
I've said this before, but at the end of it, he'd say something important and then he'd say something, he'd almost sort of partly try to hide it and he'd say, he who has ears, let him hear. And then I'm looking around, I'm assuming that 99% of them actually had ears. He didn't mean who has got a couple of these things. They actually get bigger as you get older, they keep growing apparently and things sprout. But anyway, um, <laughs> he didn't mean whoever's got ears, let them hear, he meant whoever really wants to hear it. Whoever's got spiritual ears, who wants to know, let them hear and do something about it. And that's what I think James is saying here. Don't just laugh it off. Think it doesn't matter because it matters which path we take. So what do we do with all that as we approach a new year, as we stand at that fork in the road? Well, the answer perhaps is obvious from the text. We submit ourselves, we humble ourselves. But I think... We just just come near. We come near. We come near to God. We humble ourselves. We draw near to Him in humility and surrender and repentance. Now, it's interesting because mostly in Scripture, God takes the initiative, doesn't He? God takes the initiative. Sent Jesus into um, the world. Sent the Spirit into our hearts and into our lives into the world as well. God takes the initiative. That's the sort of God he is. We need him. But sometimes, if you think about it, it's not all one way. He calls us to come near, draw near to him. But that's because that's what a healthy relationship looks like. If it was always one person going to the other and the other was never coming back, what sort of relationship is that? In a healthy relationship, there's come near from both um, parties, both sides. So he says, come near to God and he'll come near to you. Reminds me of Jesus' powerful invitation, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, going down the wrong path, and I'll give you rest or wisdom. Take my yoke, that's like, be linked to me, and learn from me. Learn the way of wisdom, the way of life. For I'm gentle and humble in heart. He's gracious. He wants to teach us. And you'll find rest peace for your souls. My way is easy and my burden is light. I want to show you a wonderful invitation. You know, I did actually, you know, I, I followed a thing on my social media the other day and it took me to another place, took me to another place. Yeah, that's what happens. And um, but this was a good end destination. I ended up this guy talking, I don't even know who he was, and he was just saying something like this. He said, you, need to, you want to know how to act at work and be a better employee or employer? You want to know how to be a better husband, how to be a better father, how to be a great friend? You want to know how to do that? I'll tell you how to do that, he said. Just come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and then you'll work it out. He'll help you work it out. Come to Jesus, he'll teach you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll graciously school us in his way of life, in the good life. And Jesus didn't give detailed instructions about everything because he just knew that if we did come to him and surrender to him, and we'd be able to work it out and walk with him and learn from him throughout life. Because when we walk with Jesus, we can actually work anything out. When we walk with Jesus, we can find the way forward in any situation. When we come near. How do we come near? We come near through scripture, through finding ways to marinate our lives in, in his life and teaching, through building our lives on his teaching, by asking ourselves that question, what would Jesus do in this situation? Through spirit, through prayer. Prayer is talking and listening. Through worship, which is actually an act of recentering, submitting, humbling ourselves. By gathering together with people who are also on that journey. By following the examples of others who've gone a bit further down the track and are living a life, have lived a good life and are living a good life. And it struck me that Jesus actually came so we could live a good life. An easy one, not a self indulgent one, but a good life. A meaningful one, a loving one, a faithful one, a beautiful one. John 14, verse 6, famous words that from the, um, the upper room. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And I heard some Jewish uh, rabbis who'd become Christian, and they're actually not sure they were. They just were interpreting that from a Jewish perspective. And they said, when you Christians look at that verse, you think Jesus is saying how to get to heaven, how to be saved. But when we look at it, in our context with our background, we understand what he's really saying. What he's really saying is, I am the way to live. 
I'm the way to live. Life is found in him, life. That following him is the path to a good, true and beautiful life. And I love that the early Christians were known as followers of the way. The way to live. The way to life. Followers of the way. You know, in this <coughs> book, The Good Life, by these dudes, after all their decades of research, turns out the secret to the good life, longest and happiest life, is deep and strong relationships with family and friends and community, and particularly if you add into that faith as well. That's the best, most happiest people on earth. Interestingly to me, the very things Jesus came to bring us. So it turns out the answer's not in that book, it's in this one. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, this wisdom from James, just calling us to live wisely, to follow your path in life. Lord, I pray that we'd be people who do that. Lord, thank you that you're actually jealous for us in a good way. You care about each person here, each, each of us. You want us to live a good life to live life well, to have healthy relationships, to be people of character. Lord, that's what you want for us. I pray that we would walk down the right path. We would walk with you, Jesus, and find life to that because you want us to learn from you. You want us to be gentle. You're gentle and humble and gracious. You want to teach us. And I pray we'd find ways to walk with you each day because you are the way and the truth and the life. I just invite uh, any of us, all of us, if you just want to say, Jesus, I want to come to you, draw near to you again. Now, none of us want to be that Christian atheist who has the beliefs but lives like it don't exist. But it's so easy to forget or, to, or maybe our prayers have been a bit selfish, really, if we've prayed them. I just invite you to say, Jesus, I want to come. I draw near to you. Because it says if we draw near to him in genuineness and humility, he'll draw near to us, to promise if we humble ourselves before him, he'll lift us up. I invite you to say something if you want to, to him. And I pray for wisdom for each of us. We all face situations. It says in James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of us lacks wisdom, we should ask God who gives generously. But maybe you want to ask for wisdom, even for a certain thing. Lord, thank you that you love us, that we can run to you. And as Richard said, that you've got those like mother hen arms. You want to shelter us and lead us and guide us. Lord, we, you know, we run to you, not physically, but we run to you in our spirit and our hearts. And help us to run together, I pray, as a church community. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right, you stand as we sing. Can you